Elias one kind of Elias Hey, welcome back to the Behind the Well show. Roger back with Elias after a couple week break. How you doing, Eli? I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? Good. I um we had a good vacation. We just got well, I shouldn't say it was a vacation, but we were at the LPL Focus Conference in San Diego and we had a lot of good insights. We've got a lot of good stories from that trip. Some yeah. are some are good, some maybe not so good, but it was a it was a good time. I hope you had a good time too. It was. It was a great time. And uh got to see Brian Adams live in concert the last night we were there and I felt like everyone was shocked by how many of his songs you know that you don't know he's the you don't know it's his band you just they're popular from whatever dances or the radio but he's got a lot of uh what i would call hits those are hits they're good so when we when we found out brian adams was going to be the talent my wife reminded me that our wedding song was a brian adams song which song Everything I do, I do it for you, I think. Maybe it. I don't know. She reminded me it was. So she was really excited about having Brian Brian Adams there for the show. But I'm going to tell you my claim to fame. You know what it is. I caught the drumstick at the end of the show. And you got a guitar pick, too, didn't you? Yeah, I got the guitar pick. I caught a drumstick. So it was overall a success. I feel like I should be ready. So did, how'd you get the guitar pick? They threw that out? I saw the drumsticks going, but I didn't see the... Yes. A pick. So Megan, she's like a concert aficionado, so she knows like everything you're supposed to do after the concert. So everybody cleared the room. Well, she went up to the front and just waited. So they're clearing up the stage. They threw all the rest of the guitar picks out. So there are only probably like 25 people around, and I got one of them. But the drumstick went out. While the concert was still going on. Yeah, Brian I remember a, the guy, I because I thought it was almost going to hit us. I was right behind you. I'm pretty sure yeah. if I would have caught it, it would have clocked Megan right in the face. It was headed right that direction. Uh, but it was it was one of my better moments. I snagged it out of thin air with my left hand. And, you know, Megan's went to the concert. I just started waving it in front of her, and she was ignoring me. And finally she looks over and she goes, did you catch the drumstick? She was so excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> that was it was cool. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, we had a great time, and you know, I it seems like summer just disappeared. It was the fastest summer on record for us. I mean, our kids are going back to school in two weeks. Yeah, it's already back to school time, and I don't know. Summer, it's not very long anyway, and especially now, the even I don't feel like the kids' summer break is as long as what there used to be. I don't think they get like a 12 week summer anymore. I think total Nelly got like eight or nine weeks of summertime. I don't think Nelly did, but we got out June 1st. So we've been out since June 1st and we go back to 24th. So we're pretty close to a full summer. Ten. Yeah. So about 10 where weeks. We're at. So that's good. But that'll be, uh, yeah. Well, you know, before we know it, it's going to be 2024. That's just the way it goes as you get older. Every day just goes really, really fast. Uh, one thing we're going to talk about today, though, is last month we had a really good feedback when we did a show really that all revolved around listener questions and what was important to them. So today I thought we'd just do another episode about this because we probably got about a dozen questions sent into the show that people wanted to, wanted to know about. But before we actually get into these, I got a, a question from a friend of mine today he sent me a message okay if i win the mega millions tonight 1.55 billion if i win mega millions should i take the lump sum or not okay what are what are the terms i, I think if the lump sum's like 800 million okay versus 1.55 billion over 29 years basically it's 30 year payout what do you think? And then I'm going to tell you what i told him okay so the option so you can get 1.5 billion over 29 years? Yes, the full amount or over 29 years. Or you can years. get 800 million today. Yes. Oh, jeez. And that's all. I Okay, is it taxes income in the year you win it when you win lottery? 
Yeah, but I mean, for all intents and purposes, you're going to be in the highest tax bracket for the rest of your life. True. Like, true. If, even if okay. you got, I mean, 1.55 billion is 50 million a year. So do you want 50 million a year or do you want 800 today? What, what do you want and why? And then I'm going to tell you what I told him, which may be counterintuitive to what, um, to what most people think. I don't know. I So if you take the lump sum, you get 800 million. I don't know. I'd probably Okay, just off the cuff, I'd be tempted to take the lump sum and then figure out what portion I would need to live on and then what portion I could invest and then see if I think I could grow that to was one and a half. If I thought I could get it to over one and a half billion within the 29 years, which is probably possible. I, I don't know. What do you think? I told him it might be a hard decision, but I think I'm taking 50 million per year for 30 years because most of them have a beneficiary. I went and looked at it a little bit. Cause my first question was, can I have a beneficiary in this? If I die, what happens to the money? It still gets paid out. So you can leave to a beneficiary or to an estate. So, you know, your family's getting 1.55 billion. And I know the argument why I'd rather take it today, but 800 million is going to get turned into about 450 million after you pay tax. So you, yeah, after you pay tax, like 450 million. And I told my buddy, I said, you know, what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. Someone's going to get 450 million and they are set up for the rest of their life. But the first thing they're going to do is probably go buy a new house and they have 450 million. So they can buy any house they want. So what if they go to California and buy a $15 million house? Right. But they didn't remember the hundred thousand a month to maintain it, the taxes, all the other stuff. Well, so, when you, when you back out the tax from the lump sum number, it gets a lot harder to get to 1.5 billion and 50 million still getting taxed each year anyway. But I told them, I said, you know, I know one thing, if you take 50 million a year for the rest of your life, you're never going to be broke because you're going to get another 50 next year. So you could make a mistake for 15 years with this money for 15 years. You could blow it all. And you guess what? You got another you 50, 50 million and eventually you're going to get bored of spending money. You're going to be like, I can buy anything I want. This is boring now. But if you take it all up front, you may not get bored and you might get too much stuff and you might run out. So yes, mathematically on paper, I believe the lump sum's probably better. But when you think about how people actually, what their relationship is with money, people aren't good with money. Why would we give it to them all at one time? I you think know, if I win tonight, because I'm going to play, I'm taking 50 million a year. Why? And I told him this, it's okay, after tax, I'm gonna have 25 million. If I have 25 million a year after tax, am I really gonna go buy a $15 million house and spend it all? Or am I gonna buy one that's like three to 5 million? Yeah. Because I don't feel like I have 400 million. I feel like I have 25 million, which these are huge numbers but you can extrapolate it back down to having $250,000 a year, right? You can go from 25 million to 250. Everything's relative. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think the safest thing for people to do is take the long-term payout. I, I guess there's probably other factors to consider like what happens if the state files bankruptcy and they're insolvent? Do I still get paid? There's probably other factors here. But just from how people spend money, what the relationship is with money, I really feel like for most people, that's going to be a safe option. You might have a convenient excuse to just for the pros of taking the payout over the lump sum is people, because people I'm sure once you win the lottery, all your new best friends and family hit you up for money. Uh, well, I can't help you because, you know, I know I won that, but I only get this every year or so. I can't like if it's different if people know you got 400 some million, maybe it's not different to them, but I feel like it would be for me. I might be like, yeah, I'd love to help you, but I don't actually get what they say I get. And let, let's even go further. If a person got 25 million each year after tax, they could take the first year's payment. They could take five for themselves, invest 20, probably buy some government bonds yielding around 5%. Let's call it 4%. 
Oh, what's 20 million times 4%? A lot. 800,000. Yeah. Federally tax free. Like, are you okay on 800 grand if everything's paid for? Yeah, but you know, lottery, I, lottery winners blow their money. But the beauty is, if you take the payout over 30 years, you can blow it for a lot. You could blow it for 28 years. And when you got your last payment, you could just take that and be like, I'm going to set the last payment aside. And this is what's going to set me up forever. I'm going to be an adult now with this final payment. And the you final could, yeah, you could. 50 million. It's you still could. more than most people would ever have. So I knew that this show was about listener questions. Well, that wasn't a listener question. That was messaged to me earlier today. Like, and it was kind of saying it like, what would you do? Because he was having a debate with one of his friends. So I called him and talked, talked him through this exact scenario because I talk about with my wife. I mean, we all dream that you might get lucky. I mean, I know I'm not, right? But it's fun to talk about. Yes. So he goes, what would you do to invest it? I go, I probably wouldn't have much risk. Why? Oh, yeah. Only have to get rich once. <laughs> yeah, right. Minimal risk. Yep. So I'm, I'm sorry for going off script there, Elias. So let, let's kick it into the real topic of today, and that's listener questions. And this one's actually from... A listener out of Madison, Wisconsin, and she she asked, should I take advantage of the Roth 401k option with my employer? I'm 34. I'm saving 12% of my income into a 401k. Last month, my employer rolled out the Roth option. I understand the basics between a Roth and traditional IRA, but when it comes to my 401k, should I switch all my contributions to Roth or do some of each? What do you guys think? And I got to tell you what's ironic about this. Before we filmed the show earlier this morning, I had the exact same discussion with another individual. And here's the first question I'd have for Andrea. And I don't have this answer. What's your tax bracket today? How long do you plan on working? It's a good start. Yeah, that's the, I good, have to that's know the those first things. question you should ask. Yeah, um, Because it's not all, always all or one. And this is where you can start to put together you know, a real plan for what retirement looks like. And I'll talk about a scenario I did with somebody earlier today. But for those listeners out there, I think a couple of things to just clarify. What are the differences between a Roth 401k and a traditional 401k? I, I don't want to just make these broad strokes and assume people know that. The primary difference is the Roth 401k is funded with after-tax dollars. So it's not a tax deduction in the year in which you decide to actually make the contribution. So for Andrea, who's 34, having tax-free growth in her money, which you would get in the Roth 401k, becomes a very you know, meaningful tool potentially for to get her to retirement. The traditional 401k allows for those contributions to be all after tax or before taxes means when you put it in, you're not paying tax on the money. I think the way to decide this depends a lot on what your retirement age is, what your goals are, when you can start taking money out and how long you're going to defer it, what your income tax bracket is. It's how we make this decision and how we do it is we model it. So the, the gentleman I had the discussion with this morning I just told them, I said, hey, the best thing we can do is take all the information we have and let's model it because he's 43. He wants to retire at 53. Granted, he's probably not going to touch this money until he's 60. He also makes $600,000 per year. So he's foregoing a arguably a 40 plus percent tax deduction today to get the money to a tax free space. So I said, it's not just that easy to say, yep, this is what we should do. Both of the limits are the same for a Roth 401k and traditional 401k. The biggest decision is, do we want tax deductions today, tax deductions later? Generally, if I run into somebody who's making enough to still be eligible to do a Roth, meaning you're making under 200,000 of household income, generally, I'm pushing these younger folks towards doing a Roth 401k yes. because if you look at, we had this scenario about three years ago, Elias, we had an individual who had come into our office. They were making 160,000 of combined household income, two kids. 
and they they made the comment, well, we really we're maxing our 401k, so they're killing it. But we're doing that because we really need the tax deduction. And I pulled their tax return out and I showed them. I said, well, this is what you paid in federal tax last year. It was like thirteen thousand five hundred dollars, something like that. I mean, it was less than a 10 percent bracket by the time they had all their deductions and their kids and all the other stuff. And I said, so you're telling me today you'd rather take an 8% tax deduction versus having this money be tax free. Well, you know what they did. They immediately went home and switched everything to a Roth 401k that they were doing. Yeah. Well, and you just outlined two uh, t- those are two very different situations, right? That you're just talking about. You have one where we have a household income of six hundred thousand dollars, one re- household income of one hundred and sixty thousand. So I would say, in general, for this person who's thirty four, the the vast majority of people in their mid thirties, Roth is typically going to be a really good option because of what you just outlined, and especially if you're filing jointly and you have at least one or two kids. By the time you reduce your taxable income and then you look at the real rate, it's hard to make an argument for needing a tax deduction at that point where if you're in your mid forties making 600,000, well, that's different. That might, that might, that math might work out over the long term to defer some of the taxes. And especially like if, especially in a younger age retirement, if you're going to retire younger, once you turn 59 and a half, you're probably going to start using some of those resources out to bridge a gap until you get to social security age and you'll be living off them longer. You can spread out the taxes over a higher number of years. So that's, but like you said, it's not as easy as, yeah, you should or should not do that. Right. It's comes down to doing some planning, some modeling of scenarios and then setting yourself up. The, but in general, the Roth for most, for a lot of people is going to be a good option. Yeah. And I firmly believe that everybody should have money in three buckets. You should have taxable money. You should have tax-free money. You should have tax deferred money because it gives you options. I mean, if you think about how our tax tax brackets are progressive in nature. So, you know, in the first 10,000, you pay 10%, the next 60,000, you pay 12, so on and so forth, whatever the numbers come out to be. Why wouldn't you still want some taxable money? Because most people will be in a higher tax bracket while they're working. Assuming tax brackets are all the same forever, which they don't, but generally they remain remain close. Assuming they remain the same, why wouldn't we want to take a tax deduction today so we could have some money we're pulling out in in a tax rate that's probably lower in the future? It's not all or none. A lot of people are sitting on time bombs. They've got $2 million in a 401k and they're going to have to take more money than they want to. And we also have situations where people are in this, you know, they have 60,000 of income in retirement and they could take another $28,000 out of their 401k or so to max out their tax bracket per se. Well, if you don't have any taxable money, how do you take advantage of that, that opportunity? So that's why there needs to be a little balance here. And, you know, for me, I have some that goes pre-tax, most goes post-tax. I still have some pre-tax dollars. My wife has some pre-tax dollars, but it's because we want a little bit of opportunity. But the other thing people should look at, what does retirement look like for me? What does it look like for most people? As far as what their income? Well, they have to ask themselves that question because I look at retirement for me and the question is, does my income actually go down in retirement? And the answer is probably not significantly because I'm probably not going to fully retire, right? And even if I did, then I'd have some residual from the business that's going to pay me money for X amount of years. So I don't really expect my income to go down drastically. So for me, I don't want a bunch of RMDs that I have to take when I'm 75 unless I want to. So that's the main reason for me to do Roth. It's more because I don't want to be forced to take money out so I can control my taxes. Most people, their income is going to be much lower in retirement than when they actually worked. Yeah. Well, and a, probably a good first step would, how many people have even thought about that or really not just thought about it in general, like to do a Google search and read, oh, you're going to be in a lower bracket 
when you retire, but have really thought about it like you have. I mean, you you know that your income's probably not going to go down when you retire. There's other people that um, they really have no idea or they think it's going to go down, but then the reality is it never does because of their lifestyle. And it's a lot of things people, you have to look at. Right. And most people, not most, I've never retired. When we help family transition to retirement, no one ever asks, how do I have less lifestyle when I'm not working? That's not something people are interested in. People want at minimum the same lifestyle that they have while they're working. I once heard at a workshop I was at that there's only one thing worse than running out of money. And that's actually running out of lifestyle. Yeah, it might not be working, but you can't can't do anything. Yeah, so I think with that said, the best thing for Andrea to do, or really anybody who's facing the decision of what path should I go, just go with a good financial advisor, tax preparer, you know, someone that does financial things for a living that can figure out a way to quantify and help guide you down the appropriate path as to which option might be optimal for you. There's so many factors. You may not always pick the greatest option, but I still believe most people should have some pre-tax money, so tax deferred, some taxable, and some tax-free assets, you know, in their overall portfolio. Yeah. So the and the the questions around Roth, um, the topic of Roth versus traditional, were pretty popular um, recently. So we have another question here. It's about Roth conversions. So what is a Roth conversion? It's taking money from your traditional IRA, transferring it to your Roth IRA, and then paying the paying that tax bill to as part of that transaction. So the question uh, comes from Samuel out of Des Moines, Iowa. Do I have to wait until retirement to do a Roth conversion? I'm 42 years old. I have 90000 in a traditional IRA. I met with a financial advisor a few years ago who said it would be best to wait until retirement to do a conversion. My brother-in-law recently did a conversion on some of his IRAs and he's only 46. Is there a reason to wait or do I do it now? Um, so just first off, if I guess I would think if a financial, if you did some financial planning and they recommended waiting, there was probably a good reason for recommending that. But let's talk about some of the things to consider. So if, if this question was proposed to me, it's, I'm going to start thinking first, uh, what tax, like what tax bracket do you land in now? So then we can decide, should we do it? I think in general at 42 years old, as long as the tax works out and you're not like pushing yourself up or paying excess that you don't have to at 42 years old, you have a long time for tax-free growth. So I can probably start to make an argument that you should do something like that. Um, the considerations are, okay, if you do, at least for Samuel, if you do all 90,000 this year, is that a, you know, how does that move impact your situation versus maybe it'd be better to do 5,000 a year for X amount of year, 10,000 a year for X amount of years. So, so those are some of the questions and some of the things to think about, you know, when to do a Roth conversion is a very popular question. And a lot of times when you're watching the financial media and maybe just Google searching for advice, you'll see that the best time to do it is between retirement and age 62. And a lot of times they believe a lot of times that would be some of the in general advice because you're probably going to be maybe delaying social security at least until full retirement age and living off of your IRA money and then potentially doing some conversions would go into that as well. But again, it's something where, you know, for someone who part of this question was, well, my brother-in-law did it at age 46. So age is a factor. I would think though that just, it's one of those things, okay, someone else did it, but that doesn't mean that it's good for you or optimal in your situation to do it. So I, th I think those are some of the considerations to at least get you started down the path of coming to an answer. The other thing can help answer somebody's question real quickly if they should or shouldn't do this. If you're going to do a Roth conversion, you should have the money in the bank to pay the tax, 
you're not going to withhold tax on the conversion. Otherwise, you converted it, but you also cut out the legs of some of the investment because you gave it a loss of 20 or 25 percent so you could do the conversion. And that's you want to keep that money yeah. invested. Why would you want to take money out of this object we're cre converting to a tax free space? Because you can't pay the tax. The, the objects get as much money in there as possible. So you have to be able to pay the tax. And that's where it might be a three to five year plan to convert this money. It might be, hey, we're doing 20 grand because I can write a check for, you know, four or $5,000 a year for the tax. Yeah. That's number one question. Can you pay the tax? And, and I've, this isn't uncommon. Like we get questions about Roth conversions all the time. It's one of the most commonly asked questions we get. So if anybody has a question and you want to get, you know, our take on your personal situation, you can go to btwellshow.com. We'd be happy to walk you through, you know, what your options are. And we actually have some really great software. If we get a hold of somebody's what somebody's tax return, we can really start to take an in-depth look at what are the optimal places we can go with Roth conversions. And the biggest mistake people make is they're converting funds at 63, 64, 65, and they don't take a look at the impact of what it's going to do to their Medicare. And then the, they two years later, like, whoa, what happened? Why are my premiums so much more? And we have software that can just really dial in how much somebody should be doing. And we can work with people's CPAs to make sure this is done to maximize this conversion benefit. So Elias, let's move on to the next question. This is from Ryan in Kansas City. He asks, how much life insurance should I have? This is a great question because it comes up a lot. My wife and I had our first baby last week. I know having insurance is important, especially as my wife is going to transition working to being a stay-at-home mom, and I'll be the primary financial provider. I have a small $35,000 term life policy through my employer, but I know that isn't enough to protect my family as something should happen. Is 10 times your annual income still a good rule of thumb for coverage? And what else should I consider? Well, first, Ryan, let's congratulate you on the new addition to your family and also being able to be in a financial situation to have your wife stay at home and raise a family. I know your wife just did that, Elias, and I'm sure it'll be an adjustment, but I, but I think it's really, really great for the family to be in that situation. But there are a couple things to, to consider about how much insurance we should get. And you asked about 10 times, and I've been doing this for 21 years. Most of the time, the 10 times number comes out to be pretty close to what somebody should have. But there's a lot of things to con consider into this dynamic. And it's hard to just say, hey, we should have 10 times. Ryan, because you're just assuming you're going to do 10 times on yourself, because if we only look at 10 times our income, your wife's now staying home. And arguably, we're going to call your wife the CEO of the house. If something happens to the CEO of the house, you're going to have a gap to fill here to take care of the kids and fund college and all these things that your wife was doing for you. Um. So one of the ways that we've been doing it recently in our office, and this is new to our software, you know, forever, we kind of manually figure out how much debt you have, how much we need to have to, to have enough insurance to cover the needs for people. And I've kind of coined the phrase that for people that are doing a financial plan, which everybody has a financial plan, Elias, whether you know it or not, would you agree? Everybody has a plan. Yeah. If you don't have one, that's your plan. That's your you plan. Don't, you don't have a plan. But- Term life insurance in general is the self-completing portion of most financial plans for people who are not financially independent. And what does financially independent mean? It means you are at a place where you can retire. And if you don't ever work again, you and your family will be just fine. So to be retirement age. Mm -hmm. Before that, most people have to have some insurance. And it's always been challenging to figure this out. You know, do we need some, how much do we need for the next five years, the next 10, 15, 20? The really cool thing about the planning software that we're using now, it actually will dial in for individuals and say, hey, in 10 years, you need 850,000. 
in 15 years, you need 500,000. It tells us exactly what somebody needs. So here's the beauty. People aren't buying more insurance than they need. Nobody wants to be insurance poor, but we're getting people insured for the right amount, for the right duration of time. We just worked with the physician the other day. He needed $5 million of coverage. He already had a million, but he only needed about 4 million for the next 10 years. And then the, the risk fell off. So we structured the policies with a 10 and 15 year policy versus what we would have done five years ago, just wrote a 15 year policy for the full amount. Well, we saved him $3,000 a year in premiums by doing it that way. So that's how we believe you should dial this in. But if you're trying to do this at home, I'm going to tell most people 10 to 12 times your income, if you're working is what you need. But then if you have a, in your situation, you have a stay at home spouse, you need to quantify what the cost is to do that job. Because while she maybe doesn't have direct income, there's a cost for her to do that. She's allowing you, the husband, or could be vice versa. It could be, you know, mom works and dad stays home. Yeah. Either way, it's a, allowing the other person to go do their job at a really high level. And what I like, what I like with our planning software is the strategies it spits out, it's specific to the plan and the goals, right? So then you're actually answering someone because that's really what people need to know. And like in the case of a non-working spouse, the program will show exactly what what that person would need to be insured for to make sure that you can still hit all of your goals, right? So that's the real risk we're attempting. We're not attempting. That's a risk we're taking off the table is – how do you ensure your family properly that you can still you can still achieve these goals? Something happens to you, um, to the working spouse or the non-working spouse, and then I think when you can present present it in a strategy around that instead of just do ten times your income, you know I think there's a little higher level of conviction for that. To me, that me, there's more reasons to do it, and it's a good way to do it. To tag on to the question, one of the big questions we get from people all the time, what type of insurance should we buy? And there's two primary categories. There's term insurance and there's permanent insurance. Permanent insurance lasts as long as you pay the premium until you die. Many of them sell benefits like they have cash value or income. Term insurance... It's like renting. You take it out for your period of time while you need coverage. And I know recently there has been a massive amount of influencers on TikTok and YouTube and all of these other outlets talking about how great this cash value life insurance is. Do we you buy term great? insurance. No, I don't think it's great. I think it's in, in most cases, it's a giant ripoff is what I really believe about most permanent insurance. Are there potentially places for it? Yes, but if you are 30 years old and you have a family and you're making $125,000 a year, you have no business buying a permanent life insurance policy. You should be buying a term life policy that's super affordable for your family, that you can afford to keep saving for retirement, and you have the maximum amount of coverage you can get that you can afford. There, people are going to try to sell this. It's sold by a lot of kids right out of college. You know, there's a few big insurance companies out there that recruit these kids right out of college to go sell insurance. They're primary selling permanent insurance to their friends, and they don't need it. I have a question. How many people would buy homeowner's insurance with cash value? None. How many people would buy car insurance with cash value? <laughs> I mean, think about I it. Hope, I would hope None. Um, I would hope what's not. the goal of car insurance to it's, get the, the appropriate coverage for a reasonable premium. You notice I didn't say cheapest reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. Life insurance should be the same way, the same way. Yeah. But why when people <laughs> take this, for example, they offer you all kinds of stuff in your homeowners. Do you take everything they offer you? Do you take earthquake coverage? No, you don't take earthquake coverage here. Why? You likely uh, don't need typically, it. Typically, we're not going to have. Likely. I'm not saying you don't. 
Likely. Yeah, it's, but it's very likely we will not. There is a fault line, though, like somewhere in the Midwest. If you live on top of a really high hill, do you have flood coverage? <laughs> you no. Know. Why would you think your insurance is your retirement vehicle? It's not. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, so, that's one of my pain points with the permanent... The permanent life insurance, a lot of times it's sold as something it's not. It's sold as a vehicle to accumulate investments. 99% of permanent not. life insurance is sold the way it's not supposed to be sold. Yeah. I don't know if that's a number, but every policy I run into, for the most part, probably not appropriate. You know, there's there's places where companies are using it for executive benefit, benefit packages. And, you know, there could be some, you know, business buy-sell agreements or your funding you know, an irrevocable life insurance trust. You're doing some advanced estate planning stuff. But I don't know many 35-year-olds doing advanced estate planning. What are they doing? They're, yeah. They're trying to protect their family if something bad happens. So that's our take on insurance. We're term insurance guys. Do Have we done permanent insurance? Absolutely. Is it part of our business? Not really. Only if there's a very unique circumstance that it becomes really, really important. Well, th those are all um, good points about insurance, Roger. And it is something, as you mentioned, it's a, it's a completing portion of a financial plan because it is part of the risk management side of our business. So if anyone out there, we can get you, um, we can help play some term life insurance. If that's something you're looking for, you can contact us at btwellshow.com. And we have another good question to talk about and this one this one i kind of have a couple answers for but anyway I'll, I'll do the question first this comes from eve and she asked about can i multitask my financial goals and the preface is my partner and i are in our 30s we're sort of just starting out financially we are working on paying off debt and staying and starting to focus on saving for the future we've done a lot of research on different programs and most seem to follow a pattern of build an emergency fund, pay off your debt, save for retirement, and other goals. And each of them seem to indicate you should hyper-focus on one thing at a time. But is it okay to do a little bit of each at a time? So, and I'll get more in-depth on it. But in general, in general, I'm a fan of doing things in order and one, one thing at a time. I... And it's, if you pick a plan, the most important thing is execution. So executing those steps. But I think sometimes you can you can vary a little bit. So we'll just use we're going to use Dave Ramsey's baby steps. Um, they're very simple to understand. We're both uh, smart investor pros in the Dave Ramsey program. So, and I think when you when you look at the the baby steps and how they're outlined and one of kind of our core beliefs of paying you for paying yourself first. Well, the first step in that program is to build a $1,000 emergency fund, which is that hard to do? Maybe it is for some people. It's not that hard, but here's why it's an important. The reason it's important is if you've struggled financially or like you have too much debt and you're looking for some direction and you've never like maybe these two they're just getting started with savings well just proving to yourself that you can save a thousand dollars in a savings account it's accomplishing a goal and it's not the goal is not i want to save a hundred thousand dollars it's a goal you can most people can accomplish within 90 days so it's a very good step now as you move through that so you know, once you get some debt paid off, if you follow the baby steps, um, actually, I'm going to slow down. So then let's say you decide, okay, I am going to pay off all of my debt. If you decide to do it through Dave Ramsey's philosophies and do the debt snowball, you should execute it just the way it's lined out because it, wor it works that way for a reason. So you order them all, you pay off the smallest, you snowball that payment into the next. And once you have that, then you start saving for retirement and setting, setting some other goals. So here's where I think, I think it's everyone's situation is different. I think you need to be really hyper-focused if, 
like your situation, if you've been living paycheck to paycheck for a long time and your savings and spending habits are not good, you need to just get really focused on the basics and execute those. If you're past that and you're someone who's been responsible with your debt, you've been responsible with your savings um, and you're investing and let's say like you have a furnace or a water heater go out. So you tap your emergency fund for $15,000 to pay that. Do I think you need to stop your investing plan to rebuild your emergency fund? Excuse me, emergency fund? Not necessarily. You've already proven that you can do that. It might take a little bit of thought and you might have to cut back on some other discretionary spending. But if you were to continue saving and investing and reload your emergency fund, which does need to be done, if you take money out for an emergency fund, you need to get it built out, built back up to what's appropriate for you. So I think along the way, you can do some multitasking. It's very situational. Um, I will say this, there are situations that I don't, that to me are non-negotiable, like step five of the baby step, savings for saving for children's college. If you are not investing money for your long-term future, I would never give someone permission to save for college. Your, your children's college is not more important than your own retirement, your own net worth, and your own savings and investing. It's it might feel that way. Oh, I should do this for them. Well, the best thing you could do for your kids is be able to take care of yourself when you're old, right? Because then you're eliminating becoming a financial burden for them. And here's our other thing we know. You're not going to retire and then your kids are going to subsidize your income. It doesn't work that way. I mean, they might help you out with some stuff, but you're not going to be able to retire and live off of them. So I think in general... Once you decide how you're going to work through your plan, you should be very diligent in that and focused on one step at a time. Life happens, so there's going to be situations where you can multitask and accomplish a couple a couple different things at once. But, um, but, but those are some of my thoughts on that. I think we've got time for one more question. I chose this question for two reasons. One... I recently read a study from the Stanford Graduate School of Business about this, but two, I'm an avid fisherman. And I think I actually have some really personal insight to this question. Um, actually, I thought my, I was asking Molly the question when this guy asked it, but this is from Wayne in Missouri. Wayne asked, should I go cash only? I am 46 and I like to fish. My wife and I have been focused on tracking our spending to get a better idea of our budget and how much we need to live on in retirement. Let's just say we were both shocked at how much I have spent on my hobby over the last six months. When I am making purchases, it doesn't seem excessive, but when I'm swiping my card, I don't think about it much and how much I'm spending. Should I start making cash only purchases when it comes to fishing or is this, or is there a better way to work on spending? So I know <laughs> from personal experience, how fast this adds up because you know, we're going fishing. Fishing is not like, I won't say it's not. Most people today who are serious about fishing, it's not like it was 30 years ago with grandpa. You're not taking a bob or a hook and putting on some night crawlers. It is very expensive. It's all this cutting edge technology, cutting edge baits, and the marketing around fishing products in general has grown immensely and Facebook's great at it because you don't even feel like you're getting marketed to, but they're selling you everything you want every day. And I've done it. I've, oh man, I have to have that. I can't tell you how much stuff I've never used that I have in my garage. The joke in my family is I have more than Cabela's. Like you don't should, go to you Cabela's. Should start, you should start like a tackle shop out of your garage on the side. No, because that means I have to buy more stuff. <laughs> Try to get rid of it. But here's a little, here's one thing. So for years, we've actually heard how paying with things with cash is more painful than with a card. And Dave Ramsey's been a subscriber to this forever. But there's actually studies that point to the, the idea of loss aversion. Like when you pay with cash, you feel like you're losing something. 
I, I, I the- agree with that a thousand percent. I know for a fact if I'm given a choice between the cash in my wallet and my credit card, I'm pulling my credit card out. Well, yeah, be try handing someone a hundred dollar bill for dinner or give them your your Visa card. It's a lot right. easier to hand the Visa card than the hundred. And if I hand over the cash, I might need it later. And they make it easy. They advertise it like it's the way to do it. Because they know if you're using a card, you're going to spend more. What's the first sign you see when you walk into a restaurant? You see their sign. And then right on the window, there's a logo. Visa, American Express, MasterCard. We accept all. Yeah. Most places prefer all today. But there was actually a new study published um, just last month. And this was an associate professor of marketing. Uh, He's at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. But the new society found that as we actually move to this idea of a cashless society, and really that's been developed post pandemic, you know, pre pandemic, people still had cash, but post pandemic, it is like when as little contact as possible, consumers now pay with credit to remember what they bought and cash to forget according to the paper. And I thought this is interesting, but I've actually found myself doing it. Elias, we're doing some remodeling projects. And I want to keep track of what I've been spending. So guess what I'm using? Your credit card. card. Because I have a digital copy of the receipt. Now, I'm responsible. I pay my off, as you know, weekly. But I'm going to the card because I want the digital copy for the receipt. Yeah. Not yeah, for convenience. It's for tracking. Yep. But still, in this situation, I think what, what this individual or Wayne in Missouri needs to do. He needs to look at what he has and start determining and laying out a budget for this is my fishing budget in our house. When we, you know, we, we don't have detailed stuff. Roger doesn't have a budget for fishing. Roger has amount of money that's allocated to him to spend each month. Could I go over? Yes. But then we try to even it out. We used to do the cash and got to be too much work, but we keep track of it. So, Wayne can do the same thing. Hey, Wayne, you have $200 a month to spend. That's your spending money. You figure out how you want to spend it, but you have to keep track of it. Because let me tell you what happens when somebody goes fishing. They go fill the boat up. That's 50 bucks. They got to buy some bait. That's 15 bucks. I need the new fancy lures. There's another 50 bucks. We're done fishing. Probably going to stop and have a beer. 50 bucks. Now I got to clean the fish, probably get it some shore lunch. There's another 20 bucks. Got to buy some oil to fry the fish. Trust me, fishing never comes out. It's a lot cheaper to buy fish than go fishing, but it can add up really, really fast. I mean, all the tackle stores are all online now. Oh yeah. Hey, I'm on eBay. I'll take that. I'll take one of those. And it adds up. It's not, people aren't purchasing. Most guys aren't going and spending 3000 at a crack but they might spend $150 a week on it. Yeah. Well, it's really easy to spend $150 a week on fishing gear. Yeah. And we, we've talked about that before on the show, right? How a lot of the spending habits stuff, it's not big purchases. It's the little, it's the little stuff in your life. Just like all the things you're talking about, you're going to go fishing. So you got to get your boat where it needs to go. You need gas to go out. You might need something on the way that you didn't have. You ready? Brad and I are going to Green Bay in two weeks. Okay. So I already said I have everything. Yeah, you do until you leave and then you don't. Well, no, I'm prepared. I don't buy tackle shops anymore because they usually don't have what I want. They just don't. Okay, so you have So I put an online order in before we left for Berkeley flatworms. I have $150 worth of them now. Probably a lifetime supply, but we wouldn't want to run out. Well, no, you don't. And I, you can't and I, and I got a deal on it. I found a discount. Here we go. So now got it was on deal. sale. Got, yeah. So I bought way more than I needed, but I probably didn't need anything. And I've actually been good about it because I consciously told myself, I'm not buying anything this year. Like, I'm not buying fishing gear this year because I bought so much for the last 10 years. And I recently switched my insurance and I had to, like, go put a value on what I have. My wife agreed. I don't need any more fishing gear. So you actually know the value of all your fishing gear now? Um, I you don't have, have to disclose it, yeah. but I'm just curious. I would be embarrassed to tell you, but yeah. yes. 
I, I have a good idea. I'm sure the amount that I insured it for is still probably not how much I have. Like it's probably still underinsured, but it's an amount that if I had to go buy all new stuff, I could adequately replace it. You were starting to get embarrassed, so you just limited the number yeah, that you put on there. I didn't really want to tell my wife. It's because okay. once again, it didn't happen one big purchase at a time. It was, you know, I've been accumulating stuff for 25 years. Yeah. So, I mean, I have stuff I've never used, but I will may use or I might use someday. But I would tell Wayne that cash is probably your friend. But at a bare minimum, you got to figure out how much you're allocating of your budget to this every month. Because if you're a fisherman, you're not going to stop buying it. Like you're going to go lose three or four lures. And if you're going to keep going, you're going to have to replace them. You need to figure out what's the amount I need to spend on this every month and then agree with your wife on that amount. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that because the solution is not, oh, I just can't, I can't spend money anymore because you got to live your life, right? Yeah, that's So not, you have to decide what is the appropriate amount that can be allocated for this because you don't, you don't want to deprive yourself. You need to be able to do your hobbies and do all the things you want to do. And, and, you know, if you get a goal and you can't stay in it, figure out maybe you buy you stuff. What's amazing about fishing hey, today? Submit your stuff to the BT Well Show and say, hey, Roger, got any extra stuff I could buy off you? I probably have some to sell. <laughs> I have sold some stuff recently. But what's really interesting about fishing is you could buy stuff that's five years old. That's still phenomenal technology. And a lot of guys sell. So there's a lot of guys who are getting all new rods and reels every year. There's a bunch of tournament guys out there that flip their gear every year. If you find one of those guys to buy from, that's where you should buy your stuff. I don't pay retail for anything in the fishing world. I always have to find someone I know to get me a deal or what's on sale. I'll give you a great example. When Gander Mountain went out of business on the other side of town, it was 80% off everything. I went to the fishing department manager and said, I will buy every single hook and sinker and the, these specific lures that you have if I can get an additional 10%. And guess Did what? they say yes to that? They just want to offload you it. You want to know how long my receipt was? My receipt, <laughs> I had two receipts that were 30 feet, 30 feet long each. But I bought it for 90 cents or 10 cents on the dollar. I'll never buy another fishing hook or weight the rest of my life. But That's I was opportunistic you can't about pass it. that deal up. The receipt was so long, Elias, I actually took a picture of it next to my truck because nobody would believe me. But they had to ring out like each package individually. It took me like two hours to check out. But it was one of the greatest deals I've ever found. With that said, mm -hmm. um, I want to thank everybody for listening to this week's episode. If you're looking for fishing gear, give me a shout. Maybe I have some. And uh, if you have any questions, you can send those to btwellshow.com. If you're looking for more content, you can follow us on Facebook at BT Well Show. If you aren't already, please subscribe and hit the like button. Leave us a review. Until next time, we'll see you next week.